All right. So, first of all, can you tell me um, what is GSK looking to, to accomplish out of this conference? So, uh, GSK has been a uh, big investor in this area for a long time. We've got a large R&D base here, our U.S. commercial headquarters is here, and this area gets a very significant proportion of academic and government investment in life sciences. Uh -huh. So it's, it's pretty important for us that we've got strong connections with the range of companies that are present here. Uh, and that, that's what we're doing. So we've got the, the conference itself and the venture capital day, which we've, we've got a whole lot of venture capitalists from here and around the US together to talk about GSK strategy and, and what GSK is looking to do with its commercial organization and R&D organization over the next uh, next few years. So it's, it's really a sort of networking and getting to know uh, those companies present down here. Uh, with, the, with the venture day, what was, what was the thinking there? That, that's, that seems like a new component to the conference. So GSK decided to do a venture venture day. Um, we've had uh, a number of ways that we interact with venture capital companies for over the last few years. So we have our in-house venture capital company, and we're also investors in a number of other venture capital companies as a limited partner. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we work closely with. VCs because they're funding the companies that GSK seeks to get its innovation from. Um, you know, a large slice of our pipeline is partnered uh, and has was originated in sort of small biotech companies. Uh, and so understanding, uh, a two-way understanding what's important to the VCs about how we partner with their companies and them understanding what's important to us. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing out there in, in the innovation sector is, is sort of important. So it's a two-way exchange and many companies many companies do these sorts of VC days. Actually, I think GSK uh, is being less formal than many other companies in how we organize, organize our interactions with venture capital. And uh, you know, this, is, this is the first time that we've done a sort of VC day down here. So what led to that change? Are you going to be doing more investing, more partnering? I'm not sure we're going to be doing more partnering. Um, I mean, GSK is being the most prolific partner and licensor uh, of the major pharma for the last decade, and I don't see that changing, uh -huh. either positively or negatively. Um, what I do think will happen is that the uh, the as the hurdles for reimbursement and for making valuable medicines rise, uh, we need to make sure that there's an ever closer dialogue between us as often the ultimate customers um, of, uh, of the uh, companies that are funded by venture capitalists and the investors. So they've got uh -huh. to know, they've got to feel that what they are investing in is something that we are going to want to buy at the end of the day. What we're buying and investing in is something that patients and payers and society wants at the end of the day. So it's joining up that chain uh, and, and I think the, the venture capital community over the past decade really has, has understood that pharma licensing or acquisition is, is a very viable exit for them. Mm -hmm. And so they've, they've actually wanted to build closer links with pharmaceutical companies in a variety of ways. So this is just an, another step on that road. Have you seen any changes in, in what venture capital is interested in investing in? Uh, I've seen quite a lot of changes over the past decade or so. Um, I think there was a period of time when uh, venture capital, there was a flight out of innovation, to be honest. Uh, uh -huh. Venture capital companies moved to safer, surer bets, specialty pharma, um, uh, reformulations, and uh, products that they would have a higher confidence would be successful over a shorter period of time. Uh -huh. And that was that was based on, uh, I think, you know, failure of markets, um, failure of a, a wave of investing around genomics and proteomics in the sort of late 90s and early part of the noughties. Um, and so following that, they sort of moved away from that and into later stage of drug development. What I've seen is that the pressures from the marketplace are driving a view that you can't continue to invest in products that deliver marginal value. And there's a bit of retrenchment back towards true innovation-driven, uh, high innovation 
uh, companies. The flip side of that, the difficulty with that, is that the valuations of those companies are not currently being reflected. Uh, uh, the, the, the value of that is not currently being reflected in the company's valuation. Uh -huh. So venture capital, uh, I think, has an has a issue that they all see, uh, which is that multiple sequential rounds of investment are happening at flat valuations, which means that they're not getting the step-ups that they used to get until exit. Uh -huh. uh, and the problem with that, if you're a venture capitalist, is that why would I invest at Series A when I could just wait eight years and invest at Series D and if it's going to be at the same price, I don't lose out, other than I haven't put my money into something for eight years and taken all the risk. So I think what's, what now needs to happen for the model to reform is that evaluations of uh, those early stage companies need to progressively reflect the, the investment and the value that they've created as opposed to being flat. Uh, and part of that, I suspect, means that the early the valuations for very early stage companies need to go down a little. Mm -hmm. The valuations for later stage companies will need to go up a bit. So is that going to drive more investment to earlier stage then? Yeah, I think that would drive more investment to earlier stage. Um, so if, you've, if as a venture capitalist you could buy, uh, you could effectively invest in something at a low price early, mm -hmm. um, that would drive you to do it then as opposed to just waiting around. Now, is this something you've heard from VCs? Is that what they're telling you? I think that what they are saying is that the uh, the fact that the valuations are flat is disincentivizing mm -hmm. uh, early investing. Um, it's a very rational position from their perspective. I think the other thing that will need to uh, change is that you know, the public markets will need to get a better appreciation of how they pick good biotech companies. Um, again, historically, there are examples of biotech companies that went public that should never have gone public. And then there are other examples of companies that really would benefit from access to the public markets that have had difficulty getting public. And I think if we are able to find ways for the markets to recognize what companies should be offered the opportunity of being public and uh, where, where they may represent valuable investment propositions for a broader share base and where they need the funds in order to really deliver on the full benefit of a platform, that they can get access and actually that differentiation I think is is, is important because you know, historically the IPO window is open or closed which uh -huh. if you think about it from a rational perspective makes no sense. The IPO window should always be open for companies that should be able to get public and it should always be closed for companies who have no right being public. Well I, I keep hearing that it had been closed and it's now opening. <laughs> I, think, I think there is optimism that some companies will get out this year. Uh, we know a number of them that are that are thinking about is now the right time to go public. Uh, but I can tell you the history from the last year is not brilliant. Um, uh -huh. A number of companies who went out and they went out of very low valuations um, and whilst they've seen good performance in the aftermarket, uh, the fact that they went out at low valuations does not necessarily really encourage